Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in, to take unprecedented measures to prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. If the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Spiritual Survival. This is episode seven. And today we have a guest that I'm very excited to have on with us. It's Todd McLaughlin. I've watched uh, Todd speak on a number of occasions, and uh, his his insights have really had an impact on me. And so I, I thought you all would love them as well. And uh, our topic today is going to be the role of covenants in surviving spiritually. So Todd, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much. Really happy to be here. So you're living now in, uh, is it St. George? I live in St. George. We moved here a couple years ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, wonderful to have you. Um, So to start off, I've I've heard the term covenant defined in a number of different ways. I think uh, the way we use it typically in the church is uh, more of like a two-way promise. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think if we ask, you know, people who were uh, children of Israel, if they if that's the way they would define a covenant, they would probably define it differently. <laughs> they probably wouldn't say they're the two-way promise people. They would probably say they're his, you know, they're in a relationship. Their, their covenant mm-hmm. is more of a relationship. Um, what are your feelings on on those definitions? Do you have a different one? Uh, and then just yeah, go ahead and and sure. uh, start telling us uh, you know what you'd like to share about covenants today. You know, in one. From one re- angle, I don't mind that definition. From another angle, I feel like it's really can, it can be difficult to understand what a covenant is if we limit ourselves to that understanding. So, you know, if you're teaching somebody what a covenant is for the first time, it's not a bad thing to kind of structure it in that way and say, "Hey, look, this is this is uh, an agreement you come into." But if we keep that, if we keep that metaphor. Um, in sort of like a financial transaction way of yeah. thinking about it. It's like a transactional thing. Um, when, when we're talking about the types of covenants we make with the Lord, that has real serious limitations very, very quickly. And we can, we can start to enter into some difficult ground because if we think it's a two-way promise, we can assume that we have a covenant when we don't. And that's maybe some of the stuff we could explore today talking about is when do you actually have a covenant with the Lord? And that might be um, a little bit of a disrupting way of talking about it than what we usually think about. And so, yeah, that that would you be saying that just the fact that we have an ordinance does not necessarily mean we have a covenant. Yeah. 100%. No, um, I don't believe that. Um, And we can kind of, I I have some slides I can share that we can kind of walk through that a little bit and why. Um, and that's kind of where it's difficult is because we believe oftentimes is that the, the, the ordinance itself is making of a covenant. And typically what an ordinance is, is it's a sign that a covenant was already made, um, especially with baptism. And so let me give an example. When we say two-way promise, that denotes sort of a transactional approach. The Lord's new covenant is a transformational thing. And so when we start to understand what the covenant really is, we can then sort of pinpoint if we have a covenant or not. And when when we have a covenant with the Lord, it's when we've experienced the transformation of what he's offering us. And that's how we know we're in covenant. Um, It's a transformational experience, not a transactional thing. So let's say, for example, we go and we make a promise to keep the commandments of the Lord but we just make the promise to do so. And we believe that he's saying, okay, well, I'll forgive your sins. And we kind of enter into this sort of like agreement, so to speak. We wouldn't oftentimes call that a covenant, but the reality of it is we don't have that covenant until we actually repent of all of our sins, because that's what the covenant actually is. Um, And I'm going to show you some scriptures that kind of, kind of push into that. And so someone might hear that originally and say, well, of course, that's what we believe. And that's what we think. But 
when we walk through it, I think it'll become clearer and clearer, hopefully, if we do our jobs well uh, <laughs> in teaching and sharing what, what the actual covenant is, because the covenant itself is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, the Lord's covenant, the new covenant is extraordinarily powerful. And so when we learn how that covenant is actually obtained or possessed, it is the type of power that is unworldly and it is miraculous. And it is something that's available to us now in the, uh, very quickly, as opposed to something that we hope happens to us way down the line. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much, but you know, one of the problems I think that we have with the way we talk about covenants is something like this. I make a covenant with the Lord, and then hopefully over the period of a lifetime um, in trying to, quote unquote, keep my covenant, we hope that over a period of a lifetime, we can experience change. And sometimes that change is even described as it's a long, slow, imperceptible process over a lifetime. But the way that the Lord's covenant work is it's not long and slow and imperceptible. It's very, very powerful. And it happens as fast as we actually receive the covenant from him. So that might sound a little weird, but we can talk about it through some slides. Well, it certainly seems that way in the Book of Mormon. Uh, you know, Alma's experience of uh, reaching the, the depths of the gall of bitterness and the, you know, I can't remember exactly how he described it, but his his transformation was very powerful and very quick yes and, uh, sometimes we tend to think of that as oh that's just the the exception rather than yeah. maybe the pattern the um, scriptures do not give us the exceptions they give us the patterns yeah and that's that may be one reason why you know you, you kind of notice a lot of people aren't very interested in really reading the scriptures deeply people are but a lot of people aren't it's kind of surprising when you talk to some people and say well you know, how much time do you invest in reading the Book of Mormon? And, and sometimes you ask people that and you're surprised to find out they don't read it a lot. And I think about that. I don't think it's because they're lazy. I think it's because we have this cultural assumption that the Book of Mormon and other scripture are the exceptions. We're reading about superheroes. Mm -hmm. You know, we're watching a Marvel movie of something fantastic and, and not something that we should anticipate for ourselves. And I believe that's a fundamental error that we make that we, we need to read the scriptures as patterns and not exceptions. And so, but to kind of dial in just a little bit to address that, because we have to be careful. Um, does that mean that everybody's going to have an Alma the Younger experience? Well, no, because there's different patterns actually working here. And let me suggest one when it comes to becoming born again, like Alma the Younger did. And that is this, your transformation always happens faster than you think and up front. The Lord will give, it, give you the full transformation way sooner than later. The dramatic aspect of that transformation is probably going to be a function of how much in you has to be transformed and changed. So let me give you an example. My daughter, when she was baptized, you know, she's a little angel. And did she receive a baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost when she got baptized? I do believe she did. When you witness my little angel, eight-year-old daughter receive that, it was a little uptick in her spirit. It wasn't this big dramatic. She's not passing out and, and uh, you know, uh, um, you know, it's going to be a little uptick. And she's not going to pass out for three days. That doesn't mean she didn't have a full and complete ch change of heart. It's just that the portion that had to be changed in her was very, very, was very, very small compared to Alma the Younger, who was, you know, borderline son of perdition. Um, because of the type of spiritual murder he had been committing against the church. So um, transformations can be very dramatic or not, depending upon how much of us has to be transitioned into the image of Christ. And um, so there's a lot to unpack with this, because there's also different types of, trans of, of transformations that are happening in different stages. And, and um, I don't have a slide on this, but let me, let me make a point of, of identifying this, because it's something to unpack later. And that is, in Moses 6, three, um, I'm going to call them baptisms, are, are identified from Moses. And he says, you know, by the, by the water, we keep the commandments. By the spirit, we're justified. And by the blood, we're sanctified. And that's really identifying three levels of baptism. There's 
the outward ordinance of keeping the commandment. There is the spirit transformation. And then there's the flesh transformation. And um, to use Moses's language and then to extrapolate that or to read all of scripture through that language, we have to understand what it means to be justified versus sanctified. And this is something we don't, I actually don't think we spend a lot of time on in the church because I'm not sure we know how to think about it, to be candid. To be justified is the born again baptism of fire um, experience that puts us into the gate when it says you're baptized by the spirit. That is to have your spirit changed. This is when your desires of your heart get changed. This is where you have no more desire to do evil, but to do good continually. This is to become born again. And this is the required transformation that we have to go through in order to enter to the, the narrow gate that puts us on the straight and narrow path. I believe that the straight and narrow path is the retention of that justified state, that born again condition. But we have a problem, Randy, you and I and the rest of the world have a little bit of a problem. It's, a, it's actually a lot of bit of a problem. <laughs> and that is, we've had these born again experiences. I, I assume that you've been through that, Randy. I, I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know you very well, we've just met, but I assume in your life, you can point to these occurrences where you felt full of the Holy Ghost and you felt no compulsion to do evil. That your heart and mind was full of, of um, desire to do good. And um, I imagine that in that experience, the idea of doing something dark was probably kind of repulsive to you in that moment. And you had a natural charity for everybody. You wanted to be forgiving. Um, you didn't want to take offense, right? Like all of these fruits of the spirit were evidenced in you when you had these experience. You may have had that experience to different degrees in your life. You know, maybe you've come out of the temple one day and you just felt absolutely full of the spirit from head to toe. Maybe you had a repentance experience where you came up from prayer after yielding your heart to the Lord and you felt that. Um, I don't know, but I'm just guessing about your, your life and who you are and the type of thing you're pursuing, you know, and you hunger after righteousness. You're searching the scriptures. You want truth. Well, the problem is, is it's almost like we're two people in one, and I'm going to simplify this way down, but you have this spirit that becomes born again, but you still have this flesh that you're you're in and you're married to and you're stuck with in this flesh, you know, to quote or to, um, to paraphrase uh, Nephi and Alma um, is, is the seeds of death and the seeds of sin are sown in it and it's fallen flesh, it's fallen matter. And that, that, that has a weight on our spirit. So even if we're born again in the spirit, it's very easy for almost all of us to, to be in that position and say, oh my goodness, I'm free from sin for the first time in my life. I'm free from bad desires. I'm free from temptations. And then a week later or a month later or two months later, you find yourself falling on your face again because the weight of your flesh pulled you back down into the natural man. So, and this is probably a conversation for a longer, maybe other a discussion but once we become born again, we enter on that straight and narrow path. Now we're traversing on a straight and narrow path till we get to the till we get to the tree of life. That traversing, I believe, is the process of continually entering into that disposition of being born again over and over and over and over again, continually, as your flesh sanctifies into the same nature and vibration as your spirit is. And that's the process of sanctification that does take place over a period of time until your spirit and your body are inseparably connected in a sanctified state. And that is the fulfillment of that entire covenant. Would you say, Todd, that that's why we take the sacrament every week? The frequency yeah, the sacrament that is, is a, too. that's a whole one to unpack because that's a whole other discussion, Randy, um, <laughs> because I want to be really careful to, to for at least from the perspective that I'd like to share, you know, when you're partaking of a sacrament, you are essentially being fed, nourished, 
in the state in which you are in covenant with. Now, I'm going to say a bunch of things that aren't going to make sense because we haven't really built it. Like, we, I feel like we have to kind of unpack a lot and then rebuild it, and then we can talk about it in, um, in a little bit better way. But a sacrament, the idea of a sacrament is, is that you're receiving something from somebody higher than you that can bring you into the state or the structure in which they are. So when Abraham goes to Melchizedek to get a priest, and Melchizedek's giving him a sacrament. When the Lord is giving um, the sacrament to the apostles, he's then having the apostles give it to the people. He's preparing them and feeding them in a certain spiritual condition that's preparing them for the next structure in which he's bringing them into. So there's lots of different kinds of sacraments. There's lots of sacraments that one will have in different levels and degrees. And um, so it's a lot to unpack probably in this conversation, but yeah, a sacrament is absolutely what feeds you and prepares you for the next covenantal state in which you're, which you will enter into. That probably didn't help at all, did it? No, great. That's perfect. I know there's more, so I'll I'll, uh, try not to get you off track. No. Would you like me to share a couple slides? That'd be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and pull this up on the screen. And do you see a big thing that says, what is a covenant? Yeah. Yeah. So these are some loose slides that I thought would help us in our conversation. I'm going to kind of just kind of talk through them. Some of them might be not necessarily in the order that we want to use, but I, I think it'll be a good structure we can talk around. So let's stop and pause as we're going through it to what makes sense. Um, and you can see that okay now? Yeah, perfect. So um, like you already pointed out, let's talk about this in terms of a relationship at, as opposed to a transaction. And when we talk about a covenant, I hope, I hope the listener can bear with us for a little while because we're going to build out a few different things that will make this idea of a relationship become clearer and clearer, hopefully, if, if we do a good job at, at, at sort of laying this out. Um, so let me, um, let me make this point up front. When we're separated from the Lord, you know, we learn in the temple, we learn in the scriptures that Adam and Eve are in the presence of the Lord and they're separated both spiritually and physically. And that separation is what causes the natural man. It's what causes spiritual death. It causes physical death. All of this, this is, this is church 101, right? Gospel 101. We're separated from the Lord. What a covenant is is actually the re, the reuniting of that separation. It's coming back together into a unity. And that's really what covenant is. It's the reuniting of you back into the Lord. And so that happens perhaps in stages. And we can kind of talk about what that looks like, and especially in terms of what you brought up from the beginning, which is, is it a two-way promise? So let me kind of like get ahead of something, a common belief right up front. And that is this idea that if we do our best here, because we've made a covenant, God will change us in the end or change us in heaven. Like, and this is kind of a weird thing because I'm going to try to try to describe something that might be a little bit um, theoretical or uh, ethereal. And hopefully the listener will identify with what I'm trying to trying to describe. And that is, is we oftentimes think of a covenant like a vehicle. Okay. So I have an agreement that if I get in this vehicle and I fulfill the conditions of this vehicle, the vehicle itself will take me into heaven or take me into an exaltation or the vehicle itself will give me an eternal marriage and eternal family. Right. And as long as we can get into the vehicle and we stay in that vehicle, the vehicle itself is the saving thing that enables me to get the spiritual condition or blessings that I want ultimately. Is that, is that fair? Does that make sense? I've heard that said before. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a vehicle that we're taking. And um, as long as you stay on the bus. Yeah. Or, stay on the boat, the boat, stay on the bus, <laughs> stay on the train. You know, one way to think about this is like, you know, uh, it's a train and the, the gospel is like a train. And, and if you get on the train and you get on the train through doing ordinances by the right authority, and then if you stay on the train and kind of the idea of staying on the train is, you know, as long as you have a valid temple recommend, that means you're on the train and you're in covenant and do your darndest to stay on that thing. Do not get off it. 
And that thing will take you to the celestial kingdom if you stay on that train. And I actually think that this is actually really a harmful concept, conceptualization of a covenant. Because again, the covenant is not a vehicle that takes you somewhere. The covenant is the nature and transformation of the type of being that you are that capacitates you to be in the presence of the Lord, as opposed to something that takes you there. Um, one scripture that really <laughs> identifies this is in Alma, when he says, the same spirit that possesses your body at the time you go out of this life is the same spirit that will have power to possess your body in the eternal world. So just because you've kept, you've sort of, you quote unquote made a covenant and you've quote unquote kept that covenant it, in your body, but your spirit hasn't actually trans, transformed that covenant that you think you're making has no power to change you. There's, the covenant itself does not change you. It's not a vehicle. It's not something that actually takes you to a destination that you want. The covenant is what changes your spirit here in this life. So again, I think a lot of times you hear these discussions in Sunday school and with people that says, you know, stay on the covenant path, get your covenants, keep your covenants, whatever that really means. And in far into the next life, perfection pending, you will get perfected in the next life. But the reality of it is, is if you actually receive the covenant, it perfects you here. And that's a really, really odd thing to say in the mainstream church is that you get perfected here. But if we understand what the covenant's actually doing to us and what perfection is, it makes a lot more sense than some sort of like, you know, way, way thousands of years into the, you know, into after you die that sometime at some point you get perfected. That's not, that's not really a thing. Um, and certainly not aligned with what the scriptures teach us about. One of the first places in scripture that the Lord introduces the new covenant. Um, and maybe we should take a step back. When we say new covenant, it's funny because that term is actually used in relevant to the law of Moses. So the new covenant's not actually a new covenant. It's an ancient covenant. It's the covenant that was given to Adam and Eve. It was the covenant given to Noah. It was the covenant from the beginning. We call it the new covenant because when Moses received the, the Sinai, um, it's in relationship to that. So when Christ came, he called it the new covenant, but it's new only in relationship to Moses, but it's not actually a new covenant. It's, it's the eternal original covenant. So just to kind of make that clear, but in Jeremiah, the, the, the original covenant restored anew in that dispensation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be a good way of articulating it. Yeah. So we call it the new covenant, but don't, don't let that trick you. It's, it's, it's the ancient covenant. It's the, it's the original covenant that the Lord gave to Adam and Eve so that they could be restored back to his presence while in mortality. And that's a key, key component. And even some of the temple changes, they've, they've uh, identified some of that language. Like when Eve talks, she quotes the Moses scripture that says, in my flesh, again, I will see God. And that's not, um, that's not a far out after we die, that is a covenant promise that they do on, on this, in this life. So Jeremiah, we get the introduction to the new covenant pretty early. Um, would you mind reading that? Because my little video is kind of, kind of uh, covering part yeah, of it. Let me get my glasses on because my sure. eyes aren't young anymore. <laughs> but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Yeah, the new covenant, the reception of the new covenant, making the new covenant is the change of our heart. It is, again, the transformation. He's putting the law in our inward parts, in our hearts. Um, this is very, very different compared to the Moses covenant. And that's where you kind of get into this two-way promise idea, Randy, where like, that's the sort of covenant that they made with the children of Israel when they rejected the fullness of the priesthood and the greater priesthood. And he gave them 
a structured form that if they practiced that form, hopefully it would awaken them to the real thing, right? So they're practicing a temple, they're practicing sacrifice, they're practicing all of these ritualistic forms and the Lord gave it to them in mercy because through the practice of forms that they might realize that they are to be the, hum- the, the living sacrifice, that they're to be on the altar, you know? And, and these prophets, there were many, many prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and um, Lehi and Nephi and uh, Alma, et cetera, who were Mosaic dispensation prophets who understood that the purpose of the law of Moses was to turn their hearts to Christ And they received a fullness of the priesthood and the new covenant in a dispensation that that was not given to the people at large. So it's kind of a weird thing to think about. You know, Isaiah and all of these had the fullness. Ezekiel had the fullness. Jeremiah had the fullness during the Mosaic dispensation. And this is why Nephi says, but we keep the the law because it it points our, um, paraphrasing, the minds to Christ. They received the fullness in, the, in that dispensation of that covenant because they repented sufficiently to receive it. Just going to scroll through here. One of the most well-known scriptures, verses ever. Unless a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Being born again is entering into this covenant. There's no entering into the covenant saying, I promise to do X, Y, and Z. And the Lord says, I promise X, Y, and Z. And now I have this covenant. No, you enter into the covenant when you actually are born again. That's the entrance into the covenant. When you actually receive the mighty change of heart, when you receive that that, uh, baptism of spirit, now you are in covenant as opposed to I've made a covenant, I'm trying to keep it. Keeping the new and everlasting covenant or keeping the new covenant is keeping the condition of that transformation. And this is like what Alma 5 is completely dedicated to is that, is that, you know, he says, are you been born again? Have you seen the song of redeeming love? And if you have, can you so now? And he's telling them, if you, if you do not possess this condition, you're not prepared to meet God. It's a very, very intense chapter. He's telling them, if you are not, if you are not stripped of pride, because that's what you have to be to be born again. Are you stripped of envy? That's how you are born again. If you are not in this condition, you are not in the new covenant. And that's a very different way of looking at it as opposed to we make a promise, we do our best to keep it. And then at the end, God saves us. It's a very, very different structure. Now, this is a hard one. I've been trying to think about how to like, you know, in our discussion, Randy, and I'm not sure I'm going to try to unwrap this too much. The principle of covenant making with God is always done through the power and principle of sacrifice. We receive a covenant by virtue of the fact that the Lord sacrificed through his atonement to bring light and salvation and redemption to us. We receive a covenant. We receive that covenant from him by virtue of our own sacrifice. And this is actually the power of a covenant is through the principle of sacrifice. Now, there's a lot to that to unpack. We're not going to go into, I don't think, today. Sacrifice is the key. There's no such thing as saying, yeah, I covenant to do X, Y, and Z. And the Lord says, okay, you got it. You have a covenant now. It's like, no. You only have the covenant when you offer up the sacrifices in righteousness. Then you're in covenant. So I'm going to throw that out there. It may not make total sense, but I'm going to put it out there. Hey, Todd, is is this uh, possibly why the the law of sacrifice seems to be tied to the law of obedience Mm -hmm. in the endowment? 100%. Now, I, I would love, Randy, if we could dedicate maybe an entire three hours just to what you just said. Why is the law of sacrifice tied to the law of obedience? Let me throw out a suggestion why, but maybe we shouldn't spend too much time on it. <laughs> Randy, can you and I keep the covenants with perfection? With, with the commandments with perfection? Can we keep? I don't seem to be able to. 
I can't either. It's a fool's errand, right? It's because the law, the Lord's law of perfection is not to keep his commandments with perfection. The Lord's law and power of covenant is that he gives us sacrifice associated with commandments because the sacrifices can always be done with perfection. And when we do a sacrifice with perfection, his power, his light, his life, his strength, or his spirit flows into us. And then we can then keep those commandments with perfection, but it's him keeping the commandment through us. Now, if we erroneously think that we have to perfect ourselves until we can, we're so disciplined that we will never not keep the commandments perfectly again in our state. This is where this false idea of perfection pending comes from that, you know, maybe in the next life we'll be in a state where we can actually keep those over time. It's not the case. You do the sacrifices and then the Lord gives you a spirit that capacitates you to keep the whole thing with perfection. So it's, it's absolutely a mind bending concept. And once you see it in the scriptures, you can't not see it. But this is why the law of Moses was so intensely focused on keeping the sacrifices, those ritualistic forms with perfection, right? Like it was very spelled out because the sacrifices can always be done. And it's through doing the sacrifice with perfection that enables you to keep the law of the gospel. Now, that's a lot to talk about. But let me give you an example. Well, let's talk, let's actually, let's talk through this. As we talk through it, it might make more sense, okay? Um, so what is the sacrifice we're to offer up? And this has been great that they changed the endowment to reflect this language or make, to clarify this point. The broken heart and contrite spirit is, I don't want to be too axiomatic or too emphatic about it, but it might be, the single most important principle that's taught in scripture. Uh, if we can wrap our heads around this singular principle, it's like 90% of our path. I'm making up a statistic, but that, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to emphasize something. The broken heart and contrite spirit is the primary sacrifice required of the new covenant. So getting this idea right is critical, is critical, because this is the sacrifice that we enter into that actually brings us into covenant with the Lord. You know, Alma says, no, it's not Alma, it's in 2 Nephi chapter 2, that it is, the atonement is only available, the ends of the atonement are only available to those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. It's a very, very powerful thing. We should, it should get our attention up. It should really make us go, wow, what is this thing? Um, the sacrifice the Lord requires of us in the new covenant is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So it's critical we learn and know what this principle is because it's all contingent upon it. Um, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm not going to make this point with the scripture. We might be able to come back to it. Um, it's a little bit out of place from the way the conversation is going right now. Um, this is emphasizing something that we're making, point we're already making, and that is the covenant people of the Lord are only those who have repented. And so that's going to ask us or invite us to actually make sure we understand we know what it means to repent. Because, you know, some of the modern ways we think about repenting is, is we do our best to like, you know, self-improve daily. Like, it's like this idea of 1% better every day. You know, if today you're a little bit better than you were yesterday, it is sufficient in the eyes of the Lord because of the covenant you have. Well, it's not really a thing. That's not really the covenant at all. Repentance in the scriptures means that you bring your entire mind and your heart into subjection to the spirit to the degree that you hold nothing back, that you're willing to, to keep the commandments of the Lord with every aspect of your heart. And until you reach that state of being, you haven't repented because repentance is turning your entire heart and mind over to the Lord at whatever sacrifice is required. 
that threshold of your entire heart and your entire mind is the broken heart and contrite spirit. Once you reach that threshold, you have a born again experience. The Lord will baptize you with his spirit. He will forgive you of your sins. In other words, you'll have the complete and full remission of your sins. And that is the initiatory, the, the, that is the threshold that initiates you into the straight and narrow path, the full and complete remission of your sins. And it's done through a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So I'm going kind of fast. Randy, does this, does this taste good to you? How does this taste? Are questions yeah, coming yeah. up? Um, it made me think of the symbolism of baptism that, uh, you know, baptism is this fully immersing ourselves, um, you know, uh, laying down everything. It's precisely um, right. You're, you're, yes, amen. <laughs> baptism sign is immersion. It's not small incremental improvement. You're not stepping your toe, big toe on day one into the water and day two will get to your ankle. And three years from now, you'll get to your knee. And by the time you're 70, you're up to your waist. And by the time you die, hopefully your whole head's underwater. <laughs> it is the decision to completely orient yourself to the Lord. And no matter where you are in your, your, your existence, you could be in jail listening to this and you can go to the Lord tonight. And if you can bring your whole being into, 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 into subjection to him, you will receive a forgiveness of your sins. You might be a member of the first quorum of the 70, and you're doing this for the first time and receiving a remission of your sins. You could be a missionary listening to this. You could be a 10-year-old child who, cap who catches this, this vision, right? And you can become born again. This is, why, this is why it says in the scriptures, marvel not that all mankind must be changed from their, from their fallen state to, their, to a redeemed state. It's done through the channel of a broken heart, a contrite spirit, no matter where you're at in your life. God, I hope this doesn't get you off track, but I've been thinking this week a lot about the concept of reaching rock bottom. And it seems like the, the people that I know that have had the greatest uh, transformation in their life are the ones that have, uh, whether it was a faith crisis, an addiction, or whatever mm -hmm. it may be, um, you know, bankruptcy, it, whatever. Yeah. Financial just. <laughs> you know, uh, financial, uh, being wiped out financially. It seems like the, it's hitting that rock bottom where people realize there's nowhere else to turn, that Jesus Christ is their only answer. Um, and again, I didn't mean to get you off track, but that, oh. it seems to me that that's when we really, really turn to Christ. I'm really glad you brought that up because it's true. <laughs> and it's the unfortunate reality of this earth that that is oftentimes a thing that awakens us to the Lord is we have to go through something really, really hard. Is it necessary? No, I don't think so. You know, this is the idea in Alma 32 when he talks about um, blessed are those who will humble themselves in any circumstance they find them. Um, more blessed are they, but you know, those who find themselves because of circumstance, that's me. I mean, I had, went through circumstances that, that really turned me to this and, me too. and to discover it. Um, but, you know, Randy, let's make a point on, on what you're saying. The invitation is always the same, no matter where you're at in your life. You might be very, very wealthy. All your kids might be healthy. You might be doing great by every sort of external <laughs> measurement. Life is great for you, and you might feel great. If in that moment you can go to the Lord and you can bring your whole heart and being into alignment to him and say, I am willing, as King Lamoni's father did, said, to give up my entire kingdom to know you. If you can do that, then you too can be born again. Is that hard for somebody in that situation? I actually think it is. I think it's really hard. That takes in a great deal of intense desire. We don't, uh, we don't see our mighty need for the Savior until there is a mighty need, <laughs> seems like to me. Yeah. Um, or our need for a physician until we've experienced illness. You know, and he's even said things like, you know, when men come unto me, I show unto them their weakness. And I give unto them in weakness because so that they'll be humble. 
And if men humble themselves and have faith in me, then I will make those weak things strong to them. But humility is the key. And, and, you know, we have so many social ideas around what humility and repentance and these things mean. Humility just means that you are, you are making available every part of your heart to be sanctified by the light of Christ. You're bringing all of it. You're not going to hold any part back. Um, this is worth such a long conversation to have about how to bring yourself into a state where the Lord can soften your heart completely. Because one way to think about a broken heart, and that's what's hard even bringing this up, because people say broken heart and contrite spirit. Oh, I must have to be really depressed or heartbroken, or I have to go through some horrible thing. Well, that oftentimes, like you point out, helps you get to that place. But really what a, a broken heart is, is a perfectly softened heart. It's a heart that is not hardened by, by a false idea or because of, a sin that we want to hold on to or a sacrifice we're refusing to make. So there's different ways you can have a hardened heart, but a, a broken heart is a perfectly softened heart. And there may be no greater state of freedom than to be in a state of a broken heart when everything is released to the Lord. But that is the condition of repentance. That is the condition to enter into the new covenant. Um, it's, it's in, in one sense, it's a binary thing. You either have one or you don't, you know, you can be in different stages of a soft heart, but a broken heart and a contrite spirit is a fully completed heart. That's immersed in submission to Christ. And that is the starting point of the straight and narrow path. It's, it's not the end point. It's the starting. Point. I've always thought that the, the original christian symbol was the altar you know it's not the cross <laughs> the cross would be maybe a a symbol of of the altar or maybe there's kind of synonymous but you know it's this laying our everything on the altar and following christ into what i call the uh the fellowship of his suffering that's that's it the fellowship of the suffering Christ puts you into the same order that he is in and his order is a pattern and it's individuals who pattern themselves after the order of the son of God, which is primarily a sacrificial order. You're going through stages of sacrifice in order to, to draw down light from heaven and to give light to others. And it is after the order of Christ. It really is oh, perhaps one of the best ways of explaining what priesthood is is um, to this fellowship that you, you identify. And to your point about the altar, I mean, this is why you get an altar immediately um, from Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the first thing that they're commanded to do. It's the first step. It's the channel through which they reconnect to the Lord. If you want to rend a veil, find out which sacrifice rends that veil. There's lots of different kinds of veils. And find out which sacrifice rends it and fulfill the sacrifice. This is why veils tend to be next to um, altars. When you think about the temple, the veil and the altar are next to each other. And so if we perceive the gospel through the principle of sacrifice, uh, we'll make a lot of progression very, very fast, as opposed to, can I make myself so obedient that God can't resist me? No, you'll, that's a fool's errand. Just try being obedient to the, to the sacrificial invitations that are before you and you fulfill the sacrifices completely and you watch how fast you will spiritually progress. Um, it will be at a miraculous level and pace. And understanding this, I think, Todd, helps us get a deeper glimpse of what the endowment really is. Oh, yeah. In fact, that's going to be helpful for us to kind of walk through this next portion. Because this structure is based off that. I'm borrowing a slide from a different presentation, so but it all it all applies here. One way to think about covenant is, and I don't want to like say this is the only way, but this is probably one of the most useful ways that at least I can come up, or at least I've observed, and I don't come up with it. It's just eternal law, eternal truth, is that to think about telestial, terrestrial, and celestial as covenant structures. 
uh, or another way, in other words, covenant ways of being, covenant spiritual conditions. The terrestrial kingdom, we can think of it as a, a kingdom of glory that we're, you know, whatever in the future that we go to or whatever, or a celestial kingdom, something we go to. One of the, maybe a better way or a fundamental way that we should also think about it, maybe that's the way to say it, is that there's, there are ways of being. It's a condition of your being. And that condition is the covenant which you keep. So in the celestial order, in the celestial world, what was the covenant that Moses got? It was a, it was this transactional, hey, you do this and I'll do this for you. And a lot of it was, hey, if you keep the law of Moses, I will give you land and I will give you protection. And I'll give you these very structural, uh, celestial level blessings if you do, if you keep this level of covenant. Does it transform your being? No. Can this, can this covenant save you? No. But if you keep this covenant, hopefully it'll teach you something about what should be going on in your spiritual world, as opposed to just your physical world. And that's the celestial level. And what's really interesting about this celestial level is that's, that's what we call being called. Okay. So we can draw that out a little bit, but when you're called, you're like, you're initiated into something, you're being invited into something and you can accept that calling just by saying, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll accept that calling, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have anything yet. So for example, when you receive an ordination, we're going to show you a scripture on that in a second, like an ordination into the priesthood. Do you have priesthood yet? Well, not really. You're called into that priesthood. You're initiated into it. You received a, you received a structure um, through an authoritative hands on the head calling through an ordination. But, but receiving priesthood is so much more beyond that if we understand what's kind of going on. Um, Ascending, oh, so go ahead. I was going to say, it seems like Pre President Nelson has made that pretty clear when he's asked us to uh, seek for priesthood power. Yeah, yeah. He's pointing us to the, something that's beyond just like what we think we have when we're ordained. Um, so ascending through all of these covenant structures, we go, we follow this path of being called and then elect and then having it sealed. And that's actually an ascension process of the transformation of your being. Um, and that's what those covenants, our covenants bring us into those various structures. Um, so um, when we're called into the priesthood, we're initiated to become high priests in the Melchizedek priesthood. We become a covenant people, so to speak, at this level, right? We're a people who have formally declared themselves that they want to be in a covenant relationship. Do they have covenant protection yet? No. Not until you keep the terms, but we become a covenant people in that structure. This is why many are called, but few are chosen or few are elect. As we ascend, we become born again through keeping the broken heart and a contrite spirit. We enter into a terrestrial structure. So like, think about your endowment when you go into the terrestrial world, you know, the lights come on a little bit. This is to become born again. And now we're in the terrestrial. So your spirit is justified. You're born again, but you have this duality of your body is yet to be sanctified, but your, your spirit is justified. And so this is where you enter onto the straight and narrow path and you're traversing the straight and narrow path, or you're traversing through a terrestrial state. And the terrestrial state is where you're born again in spirit, but your physical body is yet to completely sanctify. And that's the, that's the important distinction to make. As you become sealed, sealing means your calling and your election now is made sure. In other words, your spirit and your body will be inseparably connected and your physical body is sanctified so that your body and your spirit are aligned such that you can enter into the presence of the Lord and be completely reunited with him. So we go through this process. We already looked at the scripture, but in the called, 
he's inviting us to offer a sacrifice of a broken spirit, a heart and broken, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. As we do that, we offer that up. He baptizes us with fire and the Holy Ghost. As we, oh, I should, didn't change the reference. The, the reference there is DNC, um, sorry, is 3 Nephi chapter 9, verse 20 is the reference for that verse. If you call upon the Lord with a broken heart and contrite spirit, he will baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. That puts you into the terrestrial structure. As you traverse and you endure in that condition. So endure to the end means you endure in that condition until your flesh is fully sanctified. Then we get this verse, and I'm going to kind of zoom this in because it's hard to read in that, in that model. But this is Moroni speaking about the brother of Jared. And what Moroni is teaching us in Ether 4 is that we can have the same experience and all the blessings that the brother of Jared at the veil had. Think about that. That is the most remarkable, miraculous account we have of covenant relationship is when someone rends the veil and they receive a fullness of the father and the son and whomever else that experience includes. And they see and know all things. And Moroni is giving an invitation to us, the Gentiles, those who receive the covenant of the Book of Mormon, that they may also receive that same covenantal relationship. You will see here in 15 that it is based upon, again, the broken heart and contrite spirit. So this broken heart and contrite spirit we experience at every juncture of of obtaining covenant relationship or covenant transformation with the Lord. It is the thing that we want to almost be single-minded about is receiving a broken heart and a contrite spirit, enduring in it as we traverse our flesh in a terrestrial kingdom until the Lord, we rend the veil and we're reunited in the presence of the Lord, which is the fulfillment of the fullness of the gospel. The temple endowment is the mortal experience that we should be going through. The veil of the temple does not represent death. The veil of the temple represents coming into the presence of the Lord while in mortality. And that is what it means to receive the fullness of the gospel, is that you receive the fullness of covenantal relationship to be found in his presence, both in spirit and body. And that is the great, great invitation of the new and everlasting covenant. Don, sorry to interject again. Um, yeah. As I've been going through the Book of Mormon this week, um, we, we talk about the Book of Mormon as the fullness of the gospel, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, why do we call it that? Yeah. Um, you know, because it really doesn't talk about a lot of things that are in the Doctrine and Covenants, and, but I've, I came to the realization that the Book of Mormon is a record of prophet after prophet after prophet who achieved this fullness or uh, came into this fullness of covenant that you're, that you're describing. Um, every, I mean, every, every character in the Book of Mormon that, uh, you know, was a prophet, I guess, uh, was, was uh, this level of, they were in this level of ascension. Um, does that make sense? Randy, if I could say amen a billion times, I'd say amen a billion times and take up the rest of our time. I don't I, think we understand what we have in the Book of Mormon. Amen. It's, it's this record that has been prepared for us in the last days of how we can come into the presence of the Lord, just like you're talking about. One, it, it, that's precisely how my view is as well. Um, again, they're not outliers, they're patterns. Over and over and over and over again. Lehi, Nephi, Jacob. I mean, Jacob literally says, boy, we misquote this so much. He says, why not speak Christ? Why not obtain a perfect knowledge of Christ? Right. And this is the same part where he says, Oh, there's just so much to connect with Jacob. But Jacob is exactly given this invitation. Um, King, uh, the verse that we skipped back before, King Benjamin is telling them that, Hey, you, 
you've had this mighty change of heart. It's a righteous covenant that you're in. He identifies it exactly um, because of the condition that they're in. And then he talks about that you must press forward so that Christ can seal you his. He's talking about exactly this whole, this whole process. Um, and Alma was, was uh, the Lord said unto him, I covenant with you that you should yes. have eternal life. I mean, yeah, is it Mosiah 25 or, or 26? Yeah. It's in, yeah, Mosiah somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I think it's Mosiah 26. Exactly. Yeah, that's and it. it. And then Alma the Younger does it. That's what Alma 13 is all about. Like when we understand when the Lord says the rest of the Lord, he's referencing the fullness of, of the reuniting of flesh and spirit in his presence. We get that in DNC 84 and locks that for us. Brother Jared, Moroni, Mormon. Um, Alma the Younger. Alma the Younger. It's absolutely phenomenal. And then you get into ne third Nephi. Um, the three Nephites and, and <laughs> the Zion yeah. Society. And... The fullness of the gospel is the pattern of coming into the presence of the Lord in mortality. And, you know, and to, to add one more layer to that, we also have to remember that we have the lesser portion of the Book of Mormon. And the Lord told us that he was going to try our faith with the lesser portion. And that if we didn't get the greater portion, we'd be under condemnation. We don't have that greater portion yet. Both, we can receive it through revelation, the revelation of our own ascension. And that's a lot of what uh, Moroni is talking about in Ether 3 and 4, where we can see all the things the brother Jared saw. We, so you can receive the great revelation the, um, of the fullness of that covenant. But we don't actually have it in written um, scriptural form until we fulfill as a people the, the, the obligation, the, sorry, the covenant to come into that. So I couldn't agree more. The Book of Mormon is the fullness of the gospel in pattern. And uh, if we're awakened to what that invitation is, it, the Book of Mormon is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, people who say Joseph Smith wrote it or manufactured it, he, he, a genius couldn't write it. You have, you, it's a prophet. Yeah. Um, it's so far behind, uh, so far beyond. Um, so let's kind of let's take a step back and zoom out a little bit and talk about the church, because the problem that's happening in the church right now is you have a lot of different things going on with a lot of different people, a lot of different views of the church. And I want to kind of like throw my two cents in on this, because I think you have a lot of people who are awakening to what you just said, Randy, the book of Mormon is the fullness of the gospel. And we need to go through the ascension and have our calling election made sure they have this understanding. They look at the, they look at the LDS church and say, Oh my goodness, they're not teaching any of this. Let's bail. You know, you have lots of movements who are going, who are leaving the church because they think, like you know, they're so they're so distorted or in condemnation, and you have people on the other side who are leaving the church because of problems of church history or it doesn't match sort of their progressive view of the world. Um, you have a lot of people in the church who are making arguments saying, "Hey, we have a fullness, and what we have is all we need," which is weirdly, weirdly a fulfillment of Second Nephi twenty eight. So, like, I kind of don't align with any of these views. I'd like to propose something. You tell me, Randy, if this tastes good to you or not. You can push back on it because I'm I, I have a lot of strongly loosely held strong beliefs. So I'm always open to someone uh, maybe pointing out a different perspective. What I'd like to say about the church is that the question is: is what is a church? When we say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, well, a church we have to we have to actually kind of step back and say what is a church exactly. And one way we can say a church is. It's a group of people that are in the same covenant structure. Just, it's just a group of people, and a church really is a people who are in the same covenant. So if we think of the church as being three levels of ascension, or, or there's three levels of ascension in our journey, well, I believe that the LDS church are all three covenant levels in one. And that's kind of the way maybe to think about it. And it's really helpful if we really kind of dial in with clarity of what's really going on. So you think about the church, um, we have those who are called, we have the chosen and elect, and we have the sealed, and that maps closely to three levels of church. Let's see if I got my slides in order here. So on the celestial level, and this is going to sound harsh, but it actually makes a lot of sense once you see it. If you make a covenant, so to speak, if you say, hey, I'm going to be a part of this covenant people, I'm quote unquote making a covenant, but you don't fulfill the terms of the covenant, that by definition is the great 
and abominable church. So you made a covenant, but you don't fulfill it. it means you are out of covenant. You are not in a state of being born again. That is a structure of that's the natural state of this telestial world. This, this telestial world in its natural state is the covenant structure of the great and abominable church. As you become born again and you enter in the gate through the spiritual ascension of the mighty change of heart, those who have repented, that's what DNC 10 says. This is my doctrine. Whosoever repenteth and come unto me, the same is my church. That's the church of Christ. So the church of Christ isn't necessarily a, brooks and, a brook and, brick and mortar building that you walk into and everybody who walks into it is of the church of Christ. No, it's everybody who's of the same covenant disposition is the church of Christ. It's everybody who's been born again. And of that group, those who have gone forward and endured so that it's sealed upon them and they've received what we would call our calling and election made sure, that's the church of the firstborn, which is a covenantal disposition. And so, these, are, these are the ones that uh, are, are demonstrated throughout the Book of Mormon. All of yes. these men are in this church of the firstborn. Yeah, and exactly. You get the church of the firstborn. You get all three of these examples or archetypes or structures in the, um, in the Book of Mormon, right? Like, this is why like, over and over, you'll notice that the Lord calls the house of Israel, the great and abominable church. Well, how's that? They're the house of Israel. Well, it's a people who've quote unquote entered into covenant, but don't keep it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the great and abominable church. That's um, those who keep the covenant, so to speak. In other words, they repent sufficient to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit and their being changes and they have a new condition. That's the church of Christ. And of those who go on to have it sealed, that's the church of the firstborn. So. I hope that's helpful for someone um, watching this. Let's see what my slides do here. So the way I look at the LDS church is that it's all three churches in one. That, you know, you can have represent, representatives of the spiritual condition of all three of those churches in the LDS church. So this kind of goes to something, harkens to something that we talked about before in this conversation. But in DNC 95.5, that's a really DNC 95 in the first like 10 verses or so are really, really helpful in kind of parsing some of this out. He says, but verily I say unto you that there are many who have been ordained among you whom I have called, but few of them are chosen. So DNC 95.5 has this really tight, helpful connection to the idea of being ordained and being called. Now, if we receive an ordinance like baptism and we're not born again, that's the same thing as being ordained. Or if we have a temple marriage, but we're not born again and we haven't qualified for it, that's the same thing as being ordained. You're receiving an outward physical invitation into something that you haven't qualified yet for. And that's what it means to be called. So when you got married in the temple and you actually weren't sealed up to eternal life, you were called to receive it. But here's the clincher. This is what's really critical to understand. They who are not chosen have sinned a very grievous sin in that they are walking in darkness at noonday. So it's not good enough. If we've been called and we haven't been chosen or elect because we have not yet been born again and we haven't yet received the broken heart and contrite spirit, we are in a state of darkness even though we're quote unquote the covenant people. Um, and this is where you get condemnations that are pronounced like in in third nephi and in dnc 84 where our people are called they've been officially given or initiated into an order but they have not fulfilled it through the broken heart and contrite spirit and that's a very very tenuous place to be the lord in his mercy gives us a lot of space to repent but just because we've made an ordinance just because we've received something and we haven't fulfilled it by the broken heart and contrite spirit. It means what we are walking in darkness at noonday. So again, a covenant is a transformational condition of being. It's the reuniting of heaven and earth back into a single space. It's like an overlap. This is what temples represent, by the way. A temple is what they call like an axis mundi, where 
you have heaven and you have earth and they come together and the in the overlapping space of heaven and earth is a temple or more specifically it's what a holy of holies is a holy of holies is divine space where heaven and earth meet together and that's why both both ideally in a physical way but most certainly in a spiritual representative way the recombining of heaven and earth in us as a as a transformation of being happens in a holy of holies. We become a holy of holies. Uh, and if we fulfill our covenant as a people, those blessings occur in the holy of holies. So we're a little bit redundant because these slides are, um, we've kind of already gone. This. So what is condemnation and apostasy? Well, Apostasy kind of denotes a finality that you've completely lost the covenant. You've completely, you're completely separated from it and it needs to be reestablished in order for you to have it. What a condemnation is, is that something's been offered to you that you haven't received yet, or you've full, you haven't fully received. And that's what happens in a condemnation is that oftentimes, oftentimes what happens is a people, okay, so way to think about a dispensation or a restoration is think about Moses and think about Joseph. When Moses brought his, brought the children of Israel to the base of the Mount Sinai, and he wants to bring them to the top of the Mount, which is to receive a fullness of the priesthood to introduce them back into the presence of the Lord. When the Lord introduces a dispensation, everything is given to them up front, all the invitations, all the power and capacity is given to them up front. When Joseph comes and gives the endowment, his intention and the invitation was to bring those early saints immediately all back into the presence of the Lord and to establish Zion immediately. And when, when it's not received or obeyed, what happens is, is the Lord takes a little bit of away, gives us some space, and we move into a con condemnation structure, which means we're not willing to go the full distance but he's still going to give us as much as he can that if we obey it, we can go back into it. And that's what condemnation is, is that you've been given a lot. You haven't received all of it. You received a portion of it. And the Lord is trying to get you to receive all of it. And that's the kind of the state. So what happens to any covenant? You can look at any church this way. Almost. It, 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 it's really interesting how it applies. When a when a covenant loses sight that you can reestablish this on earth in mortality, and it loses sight of that ultimate fullness invitation, what it'll start doing is it'll start saying things like, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, and you follow the hoops that we put you through, when you die, you get to go to heaven. Instead of establishing the fullness on earth at this time, it says, okay, no, that's not really a thing. What we're going to do instead is when you go to heaven, when you die, you get to go to heaven. And that's how you know something is moving from condemnation into an apostasy. And that's why the, like, the religions of the earth all teach that structure. You know, I won't name all the religions of the earth, but they all make the same claim. You know, this is the big joke you see on South Park. The, everybody's in hell and they're, they're going through and saying, okay, who made it? Who was the ones that won? And they go, the Mormons. And everybody's like, oh, darn it, it was the Mormons. And, you know, it's the big joke. It's like, which one is the one that gets us there? Well, the one that gives you there is the one that can establish it on earth and, and, and can give you that type of power. That's the fullness of the gospel. So just because you're in condemnation does not mean you're in apostasy. Um, and anything less than Zion means condemnation. So we should be really clear about like what that looks like. You know, it's like people ask all the time, well, are we out of condemnation? Well, do we have Zion established on the earth? Uh, no. Well, that's how you know. <laughs> that's how you know you as a covenant people have not moved into the structure of the fullness of the gospel. Heaven on earth. That is the great way of thinking about this. This is why the Lord's prayer is on earth as it is in heaven. The fullness of the true covenant of the Lord, the new and everlasting covenant, is the establishment of heaven on the earth not necessarily the promise of heaven in the next life. That's how you know a covenant people are fulfilling the covenant. Let me power through this. 
So, okay, I already gone through this. So let me let me let me kind of maybe conclude at this slide right here because I'm not sure if the next ones I have will be helpful, but. To sort of recap what we've talked about. You know, in lectures on faith, which may be one of the greatest things Joseph Smith ever produced, when we have the doctrines, the doctrine and covenants, I think, I think a lot of people know now that the doctrinal portion of the doctrine and covenants was the lectures on faith. And it was removed like in like 1921. I think 21. One of the sublime, critical, important principles that Joseph taught in the lectures on faith is he says something to the effect of, in order to have the faith to obtain exaltation, one has to go through the sacrifice of all things. It is the pathway through which one, and there's no other pathway through which one can obtain the faith in order to lay claim on exaltation. Our progression through covenant into covenant through covenant into a fullness is the process of obtaining the sacrifices from the Lord. The first being the broken heart and contrite spirit, moving through them until we are fully capacitated and prepared to, re to receive a fullness of his glory through the principle of sacrifice. Sacrifice is what? changes us it transforms us it is the thing that we access a covenant state of being through it is unbelievably powerful and if we can learn the gospel in its purity and we engage it straightforwardly and perform the sacrifices required at our hands the miracle of the restored gospel will flow to us way faster than we think. We can have the miracle and power transformation come to us at a rate that will be shocking to our souls if we understand the path of how we do that. So that's sort of the, the, the central premise of discussing what a covenant is. It's a state of being that we receive through the principle of sacrifice. Uh, thank you so much for probably the hours and hours of work and thought and prayer that have gone into putting this together. Can I put you on the spot and ask one last question as we wrap up? For sure. Because our, our podcast is titled spiritual survival and it's about, uh, you know, things that can help us, um, you know, in the, in the times that we're living in, how would you say this, this concept of covenants and sacrifice Maybe just in a, in a couple of sentences, how, how can this help us survive in the times we're heading into? You know, the, the times that we're heading into will either, we will either thrive because we've chosen by our own free will and choice before we hit those, before we hit those hard times to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Therefore, we will be people who are consumed in the Holy Ghost. We will have power to protect our children and our families, because we are of the covenant, meaning that we have a broken heart and contrite spirit, and the things that are happening to us will not have the same destructive effect. So there's nothing greater than we can do than to repent as fast as we can. And by repentance, once again, means going to the Lord and submitting your entire heart and mind to him so that it becomes completely softened so that the power of the Holy Ghost can, transforms you. There's nothing greater than we can do to prepare for the coming of the Lord than that singular thing to repent. There's nothing more. You can go and get your food storage all you want, but if you have, do not have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that is the primary thing the Lord needs to have you do. Uh, you can go get all your guns that you want. You can do whatever you think you need to do to protect yourself. But all of that is a telestial structure. The Lord can provide anything he wants for you. You keep the commandments as they've been given to you, but you repent and you repent, meaning you, you go to the Lord and you do whatever it takes to receive a broken heart, contrite spirit. 
whatever fasting, whatever prayer, you write down every impression the Lord gives you, and he will guide you into that structure as fast as you can manage it. And there's nothing that we can do that would be more important than doing that. God, this was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, if, if it's okay with you, maybe sometime in the future, we can have you back to go a little deeper into some of the things that uh, are tied to this. Always, always excited to talk about the gospel. I love it. I love it. It's the greatest blessing in my life. And I testify that the Lord will teach you and give you as much as you want and more. Even receiving knowledge from the Lord is based upon the principle of sacrifice. Find out the sacrifice that's required, and he will give you everything as fast as you can bear. I bear witness to that. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Again, this is the Spiritual Survival Podcast. And our guest today was Todd McLaughlin. Todd, is there any way they can uh, uh, find you uh, online or, or learn more about uh, some of the things you've, you've done? You know, this Have week we're actually launching. Or... Yeah, we're <laughs> launching a podcast and a project called the Shattering Triangles Project. And we're going to be releasing a series called Lectures on Priesthood. And so I have a blog, but I don't write in it that much anymore. It's called to awaken arise.com. But um, look for us on social media and on YouTube. Um, we're going to be releasing uh, these types of videos, but in a very methodical order, starting from the beginning, moving through. So in the end, we, we anticipate there might be um, upwards between 20 to 30 hours of, of review, starting with um, repentance and faith and going up to what a calling in election made sure um, is and what it looks like. So Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast. Again, if the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content.